to reign at the Mandarin. And this is a quote attributed to him. I, I actually have not found an independent verification of it, but I think these words are quite wise words. And he said that symptoms are the body's mother tongue. Signs of a disease or a disorder or signs of something are like a foreign language. So, as we just start this discussion about how we name narcolepsy and how we name hypersomnia and how we name all these different entities of which we're collecting a group of people here, what's the sign and what's the symptom? Thank you. So, if we say, what's the sign of narcolepsy? Okay. And a sign of narcolepsy, as we understand, type 1, hypocretin deficient, you know, knock it out narcolepsy, is cataplexy. Mm -hmm. And cataplexy is a sudden loss of motor tone. When we have an emotion, we hear fear, it can be a positive emotion, a negative emotion, right? But I've been doing this for 25 years, seeing patients. I have seen cataplexy maybe eight or nine times. So we're reliant as a physician on the patient's history. So, you know, how do we measure cataplexy? We can't really, it's just, it's a, it's a symptom. So even though it's a sign that we see, it's very rare that we see it. Um, and we know from some things Dr. Trotty said yesterday and other work people have done that it usually doesn't occur right at the onset of sleepiness, when sleepiness starts. It can be two years, three years, four years. And you heard yesterday from Dr. Trotty the 40 years, but we actually have a paper from the 90s where we had a guy in his 70s and two patients, one in the 70s and one in the 80s show up. I had a, recently a 72-year-old woman who walked in with the Wikipedia page for cataplexy and put the sheet of paper on the table and said, I have this. <laughs> now, do you really think she developed narcolepsy and cataplexy at 72 years old? No. She was sleepy her whole life when he went backwards, okay? So, kind of reason, okay? Yeah, you know, we rely upon it to make the diagnosis. And then, in the absence of cataplexy, okay, which we can't be sure about. And then think of some of the, 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 our, the phrases in our language, my knees buckle in fear, my jaw drops in surprise. You know, a lot of people may sort of relate to it and they want to make their doctors happy. So they say, oh yeah, I guess I get a little weak in the knee, you know. So is that cataplexy or, you know? So then what do we have? So then we have, as a sign, this test multiple sleep latency tests. You all go to a, how many people in here have had a multiple sleep latency test? Wow, so you know what it is, right? You spend the night in the sleep lab, you're hooked up all this stuff, and then if that's not enough, that makes doctors really happy because you fill the bed and they can pay the overhead, but then they're like, oh, we're gonna get them for more, right? We're gonna keep them the next day, okay? And we're gonna let them nap all day long, five times, four times. And they bill your insurance company about $2,800 for the privilege. And then they say, gosh, how fast does this person fall asleep? And then they say, boy, do they go into a dream? So that's a sign, right? We can say yes or no if you go into a dream. And then you say, well, gee whiz, what's the problem with that? And then we say, geez, if you go into two dreams, you have narcolepsy. <laughs> if you go into one dream, we don't know what to call you, or we'll call you idiopathic hypersomnia, or we'll, whatever. And I still, as I said, when it comes to symptoms, nobody ever, as a primary complaint, walked into my office and said, you know, doc, my biggest problem is at one o'clock in the afternoon after I have lunch, boy, I have these terrible dreams at one o'clock when I take a nap. <laughs> That's not why they walked in my office. They may say that after I ask them, but it's not the reason they walked in the door, right? But yet, we, we depend on that sign to make a cut that you have or don't have a certain label. And as 
was been intimated by Dr. Scammell just now, and Dr. Charlie talked talk about it yesterday, we published a paper. Well, first of all, this was all established before anybody had studied people walking on the street. And they grabbed him off the street and did this nap test, and guess what? Like 4% of the population has two dreams on their daytime nap. So you really think that 1 in 25 people walking on the street have narcolepsy? I mean, it seems a little ridiculous, right? So, but yet, we, the field has used that criteria, absent knowledge of what is out there if I did this randomly on people on the street. So, it's not a very specific way of making a diagnosis, right? It just says you have a propensity to go into a dream. And then Dr. Trotty and I recently published a paper in patients without narcolepsy. He said, if I do that test twice, how good is it? Like one test, you're normal. I do it again, well, you got narcolepsy? Or I have narcolepsy and I do it again and now I have idiopathic hypersomnia. So the diagnosis changed 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. That's terrible, right? You wouldn't want to have a test and say, if I did the test over again, it changes half of the time, but you can build $2,800 for it, so you sitting at lunch, ready, literally at lunch, what was that, Facebook, before, okay, <laughs> so there's a lot of people saying MSLT and then really lots of four letter words. Um, <laughs> So this was posted and she says, I am so frustrated. Here is my interpretive comments from my latest sleep study. Quote, the mean sleep onset latency from my nap before all naps is 16.5 minutes. So you'd say, well gee whiz, not very sleepy, right? This MSLT therefore documents no hypersomnia. The first two naps, though, are associated with unequivocal rapid eye movement sleep. <gasps> right, exactly. Now you're starting to see the problem. And then the doctor, in all his wisdom, says in the interpretation, this MSLT is therefore consistent with, is not consistent with a diagnosis of narcolepsy nor idiopathic hypersomnia because of the lack of sleepiness. However, Said, uh, uh, uh. The presence of two naps with dreaming raises the suspicion of both diagnoses. <laughs> right? So then the doc says, gee whiz, we're going to do another one and I get to bill you $2,800 more, right? I mean, read that Facebook group, you will see people just incredibly frustrated with this, right? And how many people in the room have had more than one MSL table? <laughs> right? So you feel for it. Right? You can feel the pain, right? You, you hit your deductible, you, you're paying for Dr. Rye's overhead, you know, <laughs> terror, right? So the foreign language, that's a damn foreign language, right? The damn test that we, my field is using is the foreign language. We don't know how to interpret it. Or is this guy's babble that you, I just read, who's probably board certified and went to medical school. That's a foreign language. You have a question. I have a comment. Uh, one MSLT is looked at by three different doctors and three different answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than two. Right. Red, res ipsaloquitur, right? I mean, it speaks for itself, as the lawyers would say. All right, so, so let's go. Let's, so we're now going to be moving into what's called the International Classification of Sleep Disorders Three which I'm not, you know, privy to share with you, but we can look at two. So here is, and this is under the classification of hypersomnia. We have narcolepsy without cat, with, I mean, with cataplexy, no problem, right? But remember the problem with defining cataplexy. And then, because apparently in my field, I don't, I'm not on these, because you could imagine what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably nothing would get done, right? So, 
So, so they decided because they're they're doctors and they love this is this is OCD. Like I didn't take my pros out. Right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's ten more diagnoses under here. I can split that pie into ten pieces. Wow, that's amazing. You're really smart. You can tell the difference between all of these things. And boy, that makes some difference to the patient in terms of choosing a treatment or what's going to happen to you. No, <laughs> that I'm aware of. So, so, but they do this, right? We do this. They. Now, this is one time I always said, you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Corp uh, Disorders <laughs> Manual for Mental Disorders, right? Number four. Now, mind you, this was Roman numeral four. R means revised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now there's five. Just we're not even there yet, guys. <laughs> He's like, no, right. no, we're not. We're, we're getting there. That but this is 4R, right? Until recently. And these are the psychiatrists. Now, actually, this makes a little more sense to me, actually. I think it actually mm -hmm. makes more sense. And one of the few times I actually say that about psychiatrists. So, <laughs> narcolepsy with catalog. Right, we know a lot about that. We're going to put that in a separate, but it's still called a hypersonic. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Genuine hypocrete deficient R. So they separate that out and they say, yeah, that's very definable clinically and biologically. Then they say, okay, there's this other broad class of disorders where people are hypersomic. And that hypersomnia, then they say, the psychiatrists love qualifiers. They like adjectives, right? So they obviously didn't listen to Puddingham Wilson and Mark Twain who said, what <laughs> doubt drop your adjectives? But anyway, they, they use adjectives. Static, meaning it, you know, kind of stably hypersonic all the time, or is it episodic? This is kind of not a bad way to think about it, and it certainly fits what I see. And then they say, gosh, you could be hypersomnia from lots of stuff. I have a medication, I have Parkinson's disease, I have myotonic dystrophy, I have a brain disorder, I have depression, and the symptom of hypersomnia is secondary to some other condition. And it's up to me to make sure that other condition isn't there. But mind you, all these are hypersomnia. Now, first of all, common Narcolepsy, real narcolepsy, hypocretin deficient narcolepsy with cataplexy is under this in ICSD-2. International classification is called a hypersomnia. It's called a hypersomnia by DSM-4R. But guess what? Narcoleptics don't sleep more over 24 hours than anybody else does. That's been shown in numerous studies. So, it's fine, you know, here's the hypnograms, you've seen Dr. Scammell show these and, and other people, you know, weight is fragmented by sleep, sleep is fragmented by weight. So, gosh, you know, I hate to say we need to go back to linguistic school, <laughs> but unfortunately, this is the bottom line. Hyper. I took Latin, actually went to a place that Greek was still taught when I was in high school, right? Hyper means above or over. Greek comes from the Greek hypur, right? Somnus sleep, Latin somnus. So hypersomnia to Merriman and actually Oxford, and it put it up here, means what? Too much sleep. <laughs> excessive sleep. But narcolepsy was put under the label of hypersomnia. Therein, the problem starts. And the problem perpetuates. So, you know, you may not think it's that important what name you call something, even at the, that simple of a level. But this is a different condition. Mm -hmm. Hypersomnia means sleep is excessive in depth, depth, deep sleep.
can't wake people up. And it's excessive in duration. It lasts too long. That is totally different mm -hmm. than narcolepsy with cataplexy. But, oh, doctor, narcolepsy with cataplexy is a hypersomnia. No, it's not. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you can see, you know, so I'm not sort of welcome in too many places. But I'm <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this is just simple lingu you know, language derivation, right? But this has very broad, let's finish. I don't have a couple more slides in that. I wanted to really have this be interactive. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> this has enormous repercussions, okay? Because as we think about this biologically, you know, we think about, well, Dr. Scammell just told us, and we think about disorders and we say, geez, narcolepsy is a loss of function. I can't stay awake. So I'm missing something. I need my hypocrite, or I need my dopamine, or I need my histamine. But the fact that somebody sleeps too much may be not a lack of something, but you're too good at it. <laughs> okay? It's an excess rather than an absence. Mm -hmm. So just from naming it, we have a huge divide. Because if I lack something, I replace it. I have narcolepsy. If I have hypersomnia, I may have too much of something which I need to turn down. <clears throat> Those are two different paths. Okay? As Robert Frost says, I took the path He's traveled and it made all the difference in the world. And that's the path we've taken here at Emory. Because, you know, we took the other path. Didn't work out. <laughs> Didn't work for all my patients. So you've got to try another path. So when I see patients with too much sleep, first thing, we talk about a little bit, even in the narcolepsy side, real narcolepsy. You know, is it medicine? Most common reason people are sleepy is around some medication that has side effects. Do they not sleep enough? <laughs> Believe it or not, there's people that come to my clinic, and, doctor, doctor, I'm sleepy. Well, how much do you sleep? Well, you know, I don't go to bed till 12.30. I got all this work to do, and I'm up at 6, and I can't take a nap. And you're like, well, you know, <laughs> maybe you should sleep more than five and a half hours a night. I mean, there are people that literally Primary sleep disorder, that's why they do the sleep test. They want to make sure you don't have sleep apnea, you don't have disrupted sleep from periodic limb movements or restless or something else. Yes, then is it secondary to a medical or a psychiatric condition? Parkinson's in my or not going to roll as Parkinson's disease, myotonic dystrophy, or is this truly sleepiness that's arising sugenerous? It's arising in and of itself. Yes? to even put that slide up, and I can tell you a story about that. Um, you know, the pro I mean, for those of you who know or don't know, you know, the, the center of the universe for depression is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you've ever been there, you might know why. <laughs> it's never very sunny. I've been there many times. It seems like it's always gray and rainy, even in the summer. Um, but yeah, this is the Western Psychiatric Institute. These are the guys that drove, have been driving the DSM for years. And they have a paper from many years ago, like the 80s, Chip Reynolds took people with depression in bipolar, kind of more like. And as you know, these patients fluctuate from mania, not sleeping, to these phases where they're very sleepy. 
And he studied them when they were very sleepy. And guess what? They couldn't show that they were very sleepy. So nobody in their right mind is going to touch that, just like Congress won't touch Social Security. It's like the, it's the rail that's electrified, right? You're not going to go back against the Western Psychiatric Institute and say, as you just, I think correctly, and I agree with you, it's only what they say is all the other conditions that could theoretically or potentially in your wildest imagination cause sleepiness should, you shouldn't include. Well, tell me which ones of those are, right? I mean, which ones have been measured and proven? And actually, not many. The reason I put Parkinson's disease in myotonic dystrophy is, thank you, we did show that those disorders do cause sleepiness at a higher rate than the core control. All the rest of the poop nonsense and those things have never been shown. They're all theoretical. Right, and, and a lot of that, I think, is because the, study, the questions haven't been asked. Right. I mean, nobody's done a study looking at people with... Right, and, 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 and of course, of course, now you have this very expensive test as your gold standard, which is a crappy gold standard, but the people that run the field want you to do the gold standard, so... You can't do it because it costs too much, and they say, well, leap here, here. You know? <laughs> and you're like, right. I mean, it'll never get done now because, you know. Anyway, so historically, it's interesting. And you just heard Tom talk about this. I was, like, showing this slide. There's not anybody from Paris. In there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So narcolepsy with cataplexy was actually defined, he had the slide, was Westfall. Westfall is German, and that was in 1877, 1878. It was clear from reading that description, it was narcolepsy with cataplexy, no doubt. Well, they didn't have, you know, 24-hour news coverage and CNN. And so 1882, I think, Gillenau, who was friend, and, he, and often described it again, used the word cataplexy, or it was like it's 1881. So in many books, the old books, it was called Gillenau syndrome. Of course, you know, the French, not atypical for this situation, took credit for it ahead of the Germans who described it first, which is pretty typical for a lot of things. But that's, a, you know, the time frame. Now, cataplexy, we know, right? I mean, you see it, it's very dramatic. When you see it and it occurs, we saw some videos of the mice, it's pretty dramatic. We have animal models, the dogs, people that experience it for sure. And scientists like to do what? They like to go after things that there's not much disagreement about, right? This is very dramatic. This emotionally elicited symptom. You see it, positive confirmation bias. Very dramatic. But then there's all these other things over on the right side that get shoved out of the picture. Schlaf Krankenheim. Even the French. Somnosis. Sleep drunkenness. Idiopathic hypersomnia. Narcolepsy that. And as I've heard in this meeting, the infamous brain fog. <laughs> We were going to just get the Latin for that, and it's Caligula Nebulosa. We're going to call it Hypercaligula Nebulosa. <laughs> so maybe we need a name for brain fog, right? But this, this are from people mostly that sleep too much, right? They have a hard time getting up in the morning. They need five alarm clocks. They need ice cubes in their underwear. They, they, they just can't wait. Oh, I've had patients hire visiting nurses for their, for their, their, their uh, children when they're at college. Visit, could you imagine hiring a visiting nurse to get your child out of bed so they can go to 10 o'clock class, let alone an 8 o'clock class? This is a different disorder. I mean, come on, right? I mean, nobody, you know. So, so it's gone by various terms. Well, this is my hero. Gowers, right? This is the father of Victorian British neurology. And he saw all the narcolepsy with cataplexy. And he goes, yeah, but there's this other group of people. And they're really kind of interesting. And he called it somnosis. 
Mm. I kind of like that, you know? Right. So this is him. And here's DSM. Now we're out of the Latin. Whoever mentioned it. We're into five. We're into DSM five. And here we go. We have narcolepsy. And it's with cataplexy. And then the ICSD3, which is coming, is going to call it type one narcolepsy. Okay, this is with cataplexy, hypocretin deficiency, you know, knock it out of the park. And they're going to still include under that a subcategory called without cataplexy or type 2 narcolepsy. I guess this is okay. I'd prefer not to call it narcolepsy, which means to be seized by sleep. These people aren't seized by sleep. These people are freaking consumed by sleep. Okay? There's nothing being seized about it, right? A seizure is a sudden onset of an attack of sleepiness. As one patient told me and put it, I don't take naps. I take comas. <laughs> that is not the same disorder. Okay? I mean, I don't know what it's going to take. But this is just kind of maybe marginally better than where we were, right? But now at least they took idiopathic out, right? So you're not going to feel like such an idiot. As I tell you, when we use the word idio, it's one letter away from idiot. And now they're going to call it hypersomnolence disorder. And actually when I saw the, the versions that they were sort of proposing, it was going to be major hypersomnolence disorder. And so let's go back a second and say without cataplexy. So there's a very nice paper by Isabel Arnolf, which I totally concur with, in sleep, and it's entitled, Is Narcolepsy Without Cataplexy and Long Sleep a Distinct Clinical Entity? Mm. And I would say it is. It's just a, a version of the major somnolence. Whether you go into a dream or not, is that really, again, getting back to how I introduced this, is that really how you're going to make a distinction? Because the distinction is, how do I treat the patient? Do I replace something? Or as you heard Dr. Trotty talk about yesterday, eloquently, I thought, in a short period of time, treat too much sleep? Or do I release the parking brake? So these, in terms of, you know, distinctions, words are going to matter shortly here because we start to learn how to release the parking brake. And ergo, the words and how we use the words and what they mean and what they imply are going to make a hell of a lot of difference in terms of patient's selection for which medicines would work better or worse. But unfortunately, our stuff came out just recently, okay? So we didn't have time to change the trains that were already rolling down the hill, which is DSM-5 and the ICSD-3. But the field is clearly confused, right? Because, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, because, I mean, they have used, if you look sleep drunkenness in ICSD-2, like, they have it coded with a separate number under parasomnians. Parasomnians means you act out things in your sleep. And then under that section of the coding manual is a section called sleep drunkenness. And I'm like, you really are confused, right? Everybody realizes it exists, but they just don't know where to put it. <laughs> you know, oh, it's a hypersomnia. No, it's under the parasomnias. Oh, no, you know, I mean, it's like... So you can understand why I don't go to these meetings. <laughs> People sit around and talk about this stuff and they don't have any real hard data. You know, it's all just opinion. And I'm not sure it's serving patients very well, to be honest. I think you probably got that sense <laughs> from me and maybe even Dr. Trotty a little bit yesterday. So I, I think we have a lot of time to talk, hopefully. That was just a little... Yeah, we got like 25 minutes, so, yeah, go ahead, yeah. The only frustration is when it excludes you from medication because they've erroneously categorized well, you. Well, right, so, so, so if, you go on the, if you go on this Facebook group, you will see people complain.
complaining, my doctor's doing another MSLT so he can show that I have narcolepsy so I can get my medicine paid for. Right. The other I thing we see, uh, the other thing we see, and the only thing saving those doctors is most of the patients are young and they're not on Medicare is patients who are fraudulently given a diagnosis of narcolepsy in order to get a medication paid for by their insurance company. That's fraud. <laughs> if you did that and it was a Medicare patient and you were caught, you would go to jail. Mm -hmm. Period. Yes, sir. Um, in the support group in Washington over some years, there certainly have Heard, I've heard a bunch of people come in and say they can hardly stay awake. They're sleeping 10, 15, 24 hours for sure. Then there's another group, uh, maybe larger, maybe not, but anyway, uh, another group in which I include myself, which has commonly called extreme daytime sleepiness. Yep. And the the point of having the stimulants is because um, we're just not functioning well. We can't get a good night's sleep. This subgroup of what is commonly called narcolepsy without cataplexy or with, the point is you cannot get restorative sleep. I mean, even if you sleep eight hours or nine yep. hours, yep. It, it, you yep. just you know, you, you know, yeah, there, you, there may be more than one subtype. Right. I, I, I'm totally open to that. Right. I'm just not convinced that the, the pie, in terms of being cut into ten pieces as I went back, is the right way to think about it. I mean, oh, the symptoms... I'm not, I'm not arguing that. I'm just asking, as much as saying, yeah. well, in that case, we don't have any medication or knowledge of how to get a decent, a normal night's sleep. Your unrefreshing sleep. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so, two, two comments. So if you go and look at our initial <laughs> paper from last November, okay, there's 32 patients in there. Dr. Trotty showed a slide of that yesterday. I've and seen patients that. that have access of this still unknown call it sleepy juice <laughs> in their spinal fluid fell under all sorts of categories. They fell under idiopathic hypersomnia with normal sleep length as well as hypersomnia or long sleep length. Narcolepsy without cataplexy and then people like this woman we just <laughs> discussed who's sleepy who unfortunately who knows what, had performance anxiety or didn't like their sleep technician <laughs> and took 16 minutes to fall asleep, but still had two REM onsets. What do you do with her? You know, so long sleepers, if you looked at in the paper, we had a category of them. And, and you know, I guess you can disbelieve your patients when they tell you that they sleep a lot, you know, but at some point in time, you have to start to trust some aspect well, of humanity. You know, and the little research I've done, and it is not very much, indicates that you may be the only one who's trying to get the <laughs> yeah, <thank> <laughs> That's, you, uh, that's yeah, right. you are, thank you, and Dr. <laughs> Trotty as well. So yes. you can understand that we're having an enormous, I mean, we've had 60, remember whoever was in Virginia, we have not had a grant funded since we were, 16 grants we've sent in. And people are like, in papers, that paper took 18 months to get published, but it was four years of work, so that's five and a half years. And it's like, well, how do you know it's not just insufficient sleep? And no, why don't you do an MSLT after you treat it? Why don't you, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, she presented the clarithromycin stuff at the sleep meeting and the room was packed. There was not, I, I mean, I go to scientific meetings. I was in the second row. People were walking over people to sit down. I mean, it was standing room only. So the need's pretty obvious to the field. The amazing thing is there's a few people holding their fingers on the... <laughs> On the chokehold points that just don't want to give up something. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, Stanley Prusner, right? Who knows Stanley Prusner? There you go, right? Prions. You don't need a virus. These little, short, little chunks of peptides can cause human disease in your brain to rot. My aunt cow disease. When I first heard that in the 80s, 82, and people in the room, chairman of pathology at Hopkins, this guy's crazy. <laughs> he won the frickin' Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean. Right, right, I mean, it's just amazing. Scientists, are, I, you know, I, I'm one of them, so I, I'm to blame for it too. People gotta, you know, call a spade a spade, you know, and, yeah. Um, two things for me. One is that I get frustrated when we, in this conference and in the wider narcolepsy community, use the word narcolepsy to mean primary autoimmune hypocretinization. That's okay. Because in the, the real life patient community, we're an extremely diverse and heterogeneous group, and we don't teach patients about that. Right. Well, I. That's the part of this, but that's the, the reason I guess I'm standing here. But I guess the question is, how do you address it, you know, in, in, in that context, right? I mean, because everybody feels the Klein Levin Syndrome Foundation, you know, look at that, right? That's a really, really small group of people, right? Right. So, Still sleeping. So, um, I have two questions. One is, can you talk a little bit about the conditions that So the, the, answer, the, answer, the simple answer is the last one, which is no, for sleep paralysis and hypnagogia. 22% of college-age kids say yes to sleep paralysis. I, I mean, that's not a very good discriminator for, there's words in all sorts of languages, right? In Newfoundland, I went to Emory, and went to the psychology library, there's books written about being hacked. Okay? Oh, right, right. Being hacked by a witch. I mean, this you know, the witch be riding you in, in the Caribbean was a common terminology for, I mean, in all cultures it's the same. So it's not a very good symptom and so on and so forth. But nobody's proven them. It gets back to my whole depression thing. I mean, we think, but we don't have money, you know, time to publish it because it's, you know, we've got this other stuff we have to prioritize. Iron deficiency, I think. I mean, we've seen enough people have come in with iron deficiency who are fatigued and sleepy and we fix them and we don't see them again. People with, you know, hypothyroidism. Now there's something primary care docs see all the time and we know, or I've had it, hypothyroidism, and yeah, I slept 10, 11, 12 hours, right? I mean, nobody's ever put them in a sleep lab and measured an MSLT. So if you can't speak the vocabulary to a sleep physician, all of a sudden absence of evidence is evidence of absence. Mm -hmm. And we all know that that's not a, that, that's ignorance, and ignorance is bigotry. Dr. I, we do need to get things wrapped up. Yeah, that's fine. And since I, do, since I do have the floor, I want to thank you because I have narcolepsy without catalepsy. And it is, I have been to these conferences for many years, and it's only recently that you and a few others have actually, I begin to hear that being addressed specifically because it's always narcolepsy.